there was a fellow who uh, wrote <laughs> uh, me a comment saying that um, there was a fellow who uh, debunked Einstein, okay? And uh, he sh shows me this, says, uh, Einstein theory of relativity, both special and general relativity, uh, have been refuted by Dmitry Bonch. And I was wondering, a bunch of what? <laughs> Unfortunately, he has no ties with anyone in science, politics, and the mass media, so cannot get his work seen by many people, okay? Plus, he is poor, so he does not even have money for submitting it to a scientific journal. And then he goes on to say that this fellow discovered a new theory of... Um, of uh, economics in, uh, that will solve all the world's problems. And the reason uh, this kind of helped me cure myself, <clears throat> uh, because it turns out that this fellow, um, he wrote a book about how to get rich. And it made, uh, to me, it, it was kind of funny, because he says, why you are poor? How to become rich? And the first thing he says, by the way, I am poor. <laughs> So uh, this is the book he's writing now. He's going to be publishing it. Okay, so uh, so now you see what's going on with that. And I looked at his uh, theory, okay, and it turns out that he has this theory that where he supposedly debunks Einstein, but it's not a theory. He's just this, uh, he's just uh, attacking. Um, uh, Einstein's equations. In other words, he says he's, he's proposing absoluteness to relativity. You can see there what he's trying to do. And uh, he just says that there's something wrong with his equations. And what we answer to that is equations have nothing to do with physics. Okay, we don't do equations in physics. Physics, we have to explain how this universe works. Okay, and so you can't come in with an equation and tell us how gravity works by showing us an equation. And likewise, you can't tell us with an equation whether special relativity is wrong or right, because what is special relativity? A bunch of equations. That's all it is. We look at the physical interpretation. That's the only part we look at. We brush aside all equations. We don't care about them. We want to know what the bottom line is, what concerns physics. And what concerns physics is the physical interpretation. What is the mechanism? What is the cause? That's what concerns physics. The rest is all math and we don't care about that. Those are descriptions. Science is about explanations. That's what theories are about. Science is not about descriptions. Okay? You can describe all you want, that's fine. When you start doing explanations, that's when you start doing physics. Okay? And so this law attacks uh, the equation. We don't care about that. So. It has nothing to do with physics. Another fellow says uh, there's another great uh, <laughs> individual out there. His name is Yu, Professor Yu, and uh, he he's also apparently a dissident. He apparently destroys general relativity, and he says the following. When I look him up, he says the slide shows how our universe was created, was created by dynamic expansion. It was started from a low entropy state, Big Bang explosion, about 14 billion years ago, right? And he goes on and on. Well, again, the big problem here is that, uh, you know, uh, they want to do equations, that's one issue, but when they get into a physical interpretation of whether the universe was created or self-created or started at some point, when time began, whatever that means, when space began, whatever that means, nothing, the creation of nothing and time, you know, uh, but we have a problem with all that because the physical interpretations don't make any sense. So you cannot say the universe began. And we should put that also in, in the context. There is like two or three, at least two versions of the Big Bang, of how the universe started, okay? And you, you, have to, <laughs> you have to understand this because all the mathematicians are not on the same wavelength. They're not on the same page, okay? Some of them say, look, the universe started from a little ball. We're going to call that ball of singularity, okay? It's a little dot, okay, out there. That dot has zero volume. So if you can picture a dot with zero volume, good luck to you, okay? That's one aspect. That's one version. 
The other version is that if you take all the galaxies, all the stars, all the matter in the universe, and you keep compressing, compressing, compressing it, you know, if we, as we go back in time, everything was closer together, according to Hubble's law, right? Everything was closer together. You get to a point, but you never get to the point. What you get is ever closer, ever closer, infinitely, as they say, ever closer, but they never touch each other. All the matter never gets to touch each other. It just continues on forever, trying to get closer, 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 and closer, and closer. So we have two versions. We have the ball version, and we have the closer to and closer and closer version. Okay? Infinitely closer version. And so we have a problem because, you know, which one is the real Big Bang Theory? And, uh, of course, these people will never clarify that for you. They will never tell you. Now, the one group says that the other group is wrong. And so we have to decide, you know, uh, we can't have two versions of Big Bang. Either Big Bang was a little point that started out at some point in time, you know, 13.8 billion years ago, whatever, right? Made by God, maybe, or without God, we don't care. The point is, you know, this point started, that started the universe. And that's when time started, and that's when space started. It's all in there, in that little point. Zero volume, zero matter, zero whatever. And then the other one is, hey, you know, uh, everything was just closer together 13.8 billion years ago. Yeah, but if it's closer together 13.8 billion years ago, that means the universe is infinite because if you go back in time, you're just going to get closer, closer, and closer, infinitely closer, but never the matter will touch each other. Never the galaxies or whatever was there in those days, right? Could touch each other. So we have a problem. We have an infinite universe, not a 13.8 billion year universe, and we have the 13.8 billion universe in the point. And you have to make sh uh, you have to understand that there are these two different versions, at least two, maybe there's more, right? But we have at least those two versions out there, and they contradict each other. And some mathematicians, t you know, like one's the version, the other one's like the other version. So we have a problem with that creation of the universe because, uh, you know, they, they put that issue away beyond your reach. They say, well, the universe is infinite. And for that, they, they just, you know, uh, any question that you have, they say, well, it's infinite. That's the answer. <laughs> infinite in time, infinite in space. Well, I thought it was 13.8 billion years old. And they say, well, yeah, it is, but it ain't. And you figure it out. <laughs> okay, so that's the story today on the Big Bang. Okay, uh, here we have another thought. He says the following. He says, based on the completion of more than 70% of Michelson's experiment, the following postulates can be proven. He's going to prove, okay? Light is in what? Ordered vibration of gravitational quanta. <laughs> What's a quanta? I never saw a quanta. Well, a quanta is just a quantum of an amount. Okay, that's all it is. And a number. And he says it's a vibration of a number. Uh, whatever that is. Okay, I, I've never seen a number vibrate. Uh, except in my bank accounts. <laughs> they vibrate. Okay, so... <coughs> dominant gravitational fields adjust the speed of light in a vacuum. We are looking at uh, we're, we're not looking for the ether. We will see the, the work of gravitational quantum. Okay? And uh, says the result is a theory of everything. He's, uh, with this theory, he's explained everything. Yeah, and the problem is, again, uh, if we go to quanta, whatever quanta is, quantum, you know, uh, an amount, uh, that doesn't tell us anything. It doesn't tell us anything about physics. And again, all these people, you know, they do a lot of work out there and they want to do it through math. And they think they're geniuses, you know, because they say, oh, look, I can put an equation here, I can put an amount for you and tell you how everything began. You can't explain how the universe began with an amount. We want to see a figure. We want to see an object, a thing out there. Then we can talk about creation of the universe in physics or the purposes of physics. Okay? Now, the fellow, he uh, looked at what I discussed last time, two weeks ago now, right? And he says the following, he talks about the nebular hypothesis. He says, how does a cloud of gas do work on itself? And I suspect that this fellow is a flat earther, because it's flat earthers who have those types of questions. Uh, they, they don't understand gravity. 
and they talk about density and who knows what other nonsense. And so <laughs> they have a problem because they don't understand how, you know, gas can work on itself. In other words, how gravity can work on gases. They think gases float around, they say, you know, because air floats around everywhere. And they say, see, like air is not affected by gravity. No gas is affected by gravity. They don't understand that they are affected by gravity. Air gases are affected by gravity. They don't understand that because they run the gear, the gases float. They they go against gravity, <laughs> and this is where the problem is. They they don't understand that. So uh, let's let's make sure they understand the basics. That there is something we call gravity. That it's not a something. It's a process, right? Uh, a mechanism we call gravity. Okay, and here here we have a fellow that I always. Put up there because he's, uh, you know, <clears throat> people respect authority, and this fellow has authority. He's from Berkeley, so I guess you got to respect authority if that's what you pray to. And it says, Every atom on earth is pulling on every atom of you, you're also pulling on it. Let me read that again because some people didn't hear that. Every atom on the earth is pulling on every atom of you, you're also pulling on it. So every atom is pulling on every atom. And the only way you can explain that with an elongated object, okay, you have to have something attached from one atom to another atom in order to produce that pull. In other words, uh, just simulating here, you know, my hand to pull on the other hand has to have some physical entity in between. You cannot do it. I cannot pull like that. Usually when I pull, this one doesn't come towards the other one. So if I pull with this one, this one doesn't move in that direction. Okay, the only way I can get it to, to do it, if I have a mediator, a physical mediator, then I can pull from either end and it'll draw the other one. We can only understand pull if there's a physical mediator. These people don't understand that. Uh, and if every atom of a gas, such as air, is connected to every atom on Earth, physically connected to every atom on Earth, then we can understand why air doesn't leave the planet because it's stuck to, you know, it's being held by all these elongated objects that are connecting every atom on Earth to that atom of air, to that atom of, that makes up the air, okay, oxygen. And here, let me illustrate that for you here, okay, I've shown this in the past, where you can see that here we have the air surrounding the Earth, those blue, uh, light blue uh, circles, you know, going around the Earth. And those red ones, those are one atom of air that comprises the air. You can think of it as an oxygen uh, atom, okay? It doesn't matter. So we have one oxygen atom connected to every atom on Earth. That's what those lines show. It has to be connected. Otherwise, all that air would float away and, um, and leave the Earth. And the reason it doesn't is because every atom is connected to uh, every atom of Earth is connected to that atom, and likewise, that atom is connected to every atom on Earth. Okay, so that's the only reason for the atom not leaving the Earth. Okay, so uh, people have to try to understand that gravity even affects gases, and you know the gases are around here like a balloon. You know it floats. <coughs> so does that mean a balloon? You know the balloon, the the rubber is not made of something because it floats in the air, a helium balloon, for example. You know, uh, the helium inside there and the uh, balloon itself, they're not made of atoms, and atoms are not things, and they're not affected by gravity. Of course they are. It's just that, you know, we have a question of density here, okay? But then, and we're not going to get into the details of that, all I'm saying is we're having atoms, they're all connected to the Earth, the balloon doesn't go to, to uh, the moon. It stays at a certain level because at some point, you know, uh, it evens out the pull of every elongated object that uh, connects every atom of the balloon to the Earth, you know, leaves it standing there. It doesn't go forever all the way to the moon. And the question is, why not? I mean, if the balloon is not affected by gravity, the moon should leave the Earth completely and go, you know, all the way to Mars, for all we know. Okay, so here we have... Um, Another fellow and talks about mass, and he says mass is that is dilated is smeared through space time relative to an outside observer. Mass is dilated. <laughs> How do you dilate a concept? 
And see, they talk about mass and they don't realize they're talking about a concept and they, they're dilating a concept. The word dilate belongs exclusively to physics. The word mass belongs exclusively to math. <clears throat> so you cannot mix math with physics and say uh, mass was dilated. That's an irrational statement. Okay, that only belongs to mathematical physics, which is a, you know, an irrational religion. Uh, but you can't use that in physics, in science. Okay, and then it talks about time dilation. Again, we're, we can't dilate time because dilate belongs to physics, time belongs to math. <coughs> you cannot mix those two. It's just one aspect of dilation. It's not just time that gets dilated. Dilation perfectly explains dark matter, uh, uh, galaxy rotation curves. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It doesn't because uh, you, you haven't explained why uh, the dark matter you know, is only around the galaxy. Why is it only sitting around the galaxy? You got to explain that. I mean, why is it between the Earth and the Moon? <coughs> because if it were, uh, then uh, gravity would not work the same way. <laughs> you know, if we sprinkle dark matter between the Earth and the Moon, you know, you, you're going to have a different gravity. And yeah, so it doesn't explain it. And again, says the mass is all around us. No, mass cannot be all around us because mass is not a thing. You know, you can say an ocean is all around us. You can say a lake is all around us. You can say the air is all around us, but you cannot say mass. Mass is a concept. And they say mass is all around. They talk like that. They have this irrational language. And talking about mass here, we have another fellow. He says it's called inertia. Uh-huh, okay. But they also called it mass, yeah. <coughs> The resistance is some external push or pull. Yeah, uh, inertia is this uh, resistance to being pulled or pushed, right? And and the question is, that's a different definition of saying, you know, uh, what a what an object is made of, meaning all the atoms, the amount of matter in an object. The amount of matter in an object is not the same thing as the resistance to being pulled or pushed. Those are two different concepts. And so the big problem we have in math is that uh, the word mass has many definitions. Uh, according to Wikipedia 7, in fact, I'll go ahead in a second. Uh, but the question is, um, inertia is one aspect, but inertia refers to the resistance of being pulled. And that sounds more like weight. You know, with the weights, uh, when you put it on a scale, what happens? It, it causes some push against the scale, and the scale is resisting the push of this thingy that you put on the, on the scale. And so you can't say that uh, uh, the weight is the same thing as mass in that case, especially if you're going to uh, equate mass with the quantity of matter. So these are all different concepts. They lump them all together, and they don't realize what they're saying, you know? And again, they get lost after a while. And the issue comes because special relativity says that, you know, when mass travels at close to the speed of light, can't travel at the speed of light because it turns into energy, et cetera, et cetera. But if it travels close to the speed of light, then the mass increases. Well, how do you know it increases? Uh, what you're saying is that if there was a scale there and the mass, whatever that is, pushes up against the scale, it doesn't have the same mass as if it were standing still. And what they're talking about is weight. So when relativity says that mass increases, they're talking because of speed, they're talking about weight. They're not talking about mass at all. And if you put a scale there, you're talking about the resistance the scale uh, puts to the pressure caused by the accelerating mass. And then again, you're talking about something different. Inertia is not the same thing as mass in that sense. Not if mass is a measure of the quantity of matter. So again, we have all these definitions and that's what's preventing all the mathematicians from making sense of mass. And finally, they say, we don't really know what mass is. You know, as uh, John Wheeler said, you know, they have no idea what mass is. They, they told us what it ain't. They, t they don't tell us what it is, okay? And that's the issue. If they can't tell us what it is, we, can't, we don't care what it ain't, okay? And here you see the different definitions according to the Wikipedia. It says, in mathematics, I think that's what it says, one may distinguish conceptually between at least seven different aspects of mass 
or seven physical notions that involve the concept of mass. There are a number of ways mass can be operationally defined. And operational and functional definitions are all irrational. They come at the end of the uh, desert dissertation. They don't come at the beginning. The way it works in science, you have to define first so we can follow your presentation. What these people do is say, let me run an experiment, let me do an operation, and then uh, what will happen at the end of that will be the definition. <laughs> so you need to perform an experiment to arrive at a definition. But here you can see some of the uh, bubbles that they have because they have all these different definitions. They have inertial mass, active gravitational mass, passive gravitational mass, and um, says rest energy, uh, curvature of space time, a different, a different notion altogether, and quantum mass. And they have all these different definitions. Okay, so you can look them up in the Wikipedia and you'll find all these different versions of what mass is. And yeah, we don't know what mass is because the mathematician, the guy giving the presentation, the one who's vouching for mass has to tell you what mass is. If he cannot tell you, well, you know, I'm sorry, you know, your, your dissertation is over. <laughs> you haven't taught us anything. We haven't learned anything from you. Okay, and so this is, this is a big part of the problem. Okay, and finally we have another fellow, and he says the following. He says that in fantasy, not present in the material world, is fantasy and not present in the material world. Uh, then it is part of reality. Video games uh, are present in reality. While video games may not be natural, it does not mean they are not present. Present? Present? What do you mean a video game is present? What are you referring to? The screen? The TV set, yeah, that is present. The video game is just a concept there, you know? I mean, what are you talking about? You're talking about the what you're playing there, the, the uh, images that are moving on the screen, the pixels? You know, what, what are we talking about? And so you have to identify the object that you're talking about before you talk about the word real or exist, right? You know, when you go into a virtual reality world using VR headset, you know, those things that they put on their head and they can... Uh, hear what they're seeing or maybe something different, whatever. Uh, you feel the same chemical reactions of anxiety and love. Yeah, that's, that's observation. And we don't have observers in science. We don't have witnesses in science. We don't care what you're seeing, what you're experiencing. We want to know what Mother Nature actually does. Okay. So again, what is real? Well, to know what is real, you have to define the world real. You have to define this, this fantastic world word and here it is uh, we say um, exist physical presence okay that's what real means because it's a synonym and when it means first it has to be an object and video game if we're referring to the game itself you know the images that are going on the screen that's not real that's not an object what's what's the real object is the pixel on the screen that's a real object but the game the way that you're experiencing that's not real uh, we don't care about that. That's you can't use the word real to describe what you're feeling, what you're seeing. Okay, and this is the problem. These people mix uh, philosophy with physics, and they think they can bring their feelings into physics and say, "Oh, this is what I'm feeling. This is what I'm seeing. It's real to me." Yeah, you're using the word real of ordinary speech. You're not using the word real and exist of science. In science, exists physical presence. It's got to be an object. So please identify the object before you use the word real or exist. You need to identify the object. And until you do that, you can't begin to, to talk. And this fellow thinks that because it's real to him, using the notion of ordinary speech, and, um, and because he feels it, he, he, he's sensing all this stuff, that to him it's real. Yeah, but for that, you need to define the word real. I'm sorry. You had to define the word real, otherwise you're going to run around in circles like all atheists, theists, and agnostics who never define the word exists, and they say, well, God exists, and the other guy says, no, God doesn't exist. And the, other, the third guy says, well, I don't know if he exists or not, I don't know what test we can run. Yeah, because they never define the word exist. It's very simple. Whether God exists or not has to do with definitions, only with definitions, not with whether you believe or not believe or know and don't know. You say, let us assume that God exists. What do you mean by that? You mean that God is a physical object first, and second, that if uh, this God thingy, whatever it is, 
has distance with respect to me that I can uh, put a straight line of direction from me to that thing. If God looks like a human being, you know, like the Bible says, no problem. Then there's got to be a straight line of direction from God's chest to my chest. Okay? Then God exists. He exists not because I believe or stop believing. God exists by definition. Because that's what I mean by exist. I mean that God is a physical object and he has location. Then, then God exists. And so we say, let us assume that God exists. Now you can explain whatever you want. Because now you've justified the existence of God for the purposes of your theory. That's about And same goes for space-time. You can say space-time exists. Well, what do you mean by that? Is space-time an object, a thing? And if it is, hey, draw a picture of space-time. Once you do that, okay, no problem now. If you want space-time to exist, it has to have location. There has to be distance between my chest and space-time. Then space-time exists by definition, not because I believe or stop believing. 